A few weeks ago, I got an email asking about higher accuracy power meters. Over the years, only a handful of people have really broached the question of how to truly test power meter accuracy, and they're pretty obvious who they are. As I replied to this person, explaining that this is actually kind of a moot point. Our current methods and the limitations of how this data is transmitted and stored really means that you can't test beyond about a 1% error. Firstly, I need to explain that most people's grade school scientific methods are the problem. In school, most people were taught experimental error. That is experiment minus the theoretical divided by the theoretical gives your experimental error as in the error of the experiment. But when you're actually comparing two experiments and you don't have a theoretical, well, what most people try and do is they start subbing in an experiment one minus experiment two divided, divided by what? We, we don't know. And in a lot of cases, they end up choosing one and calling that the correct one. And that isn't right. Taking the results of experiment one minus experiment two divided by experiment two gives one result. And reversing that, taking experiment two minus experiment one divided by experiment one gives another result. And sometimes they're kind of close, but other times it's very easy to see why these are completely different. So when you have two experimental results, you don't know which one of those should be the reference let alone if either of them are actually correct. So when comparing multiple experiments, we can actually resolve that first kind of problem pretty easily. It's actually uh, a very simple matter of taking your experimental result that you want to compare to the others minus the average, and then you divide by the average. So, if you only have two, it's experiment one minus the average of experiment one and two, all divided by the average of experiment one and two. And you can keep expanding that out to almost any number. And that's the correct way to actually compare consistently experimental error between two things. The other problem of understanding if any of these experimental results are truly correct without a theoretical reference, well, that's quite a bit harder. When you have two experimental devices that have similarly claimed accuracy, you cannot choose which one is correct. It'll result in one of a few scenarios. If both are within their aggregated claimed accuracy, you can sort of say that they're both probably correct, but you, you can't claim one is better than the other. So what about the scenario where A and B are different? How do you choose experimental device A over experimental device B to be the reference and the most correct, especially when they have the same claimed accuracy? You don't have an external reference. In the past, I have seen people and peer reviewed publications make this claim based on things so trivial as brand. And in those cases, those authors, well, they're either charlatans, liars, um, biased, bribed, or maybe they're just stupid and don't understand scientific methods. Simply put, you cannot know of two tests or two devices, which one is right and which one is wrong. We need something else. And we don't have a theoretical perfect ideal anywhere, so we're going to need another method. The two methods that I generally accept are what I like to call the odd man out and the transitive property. The odd man out is quite simple. Imagine you have a minimum of three devices operating simultaneously. Now, if they all line up, that's great. They're all probably around their similarly claimed accuracy. There, there's, there might be some deviation. One might be a little higher than the other, but it's really hard to tell. And you toss them up and say, yeah, it looks right. 
But what if one of the three is an outlier? Well, what you can kind of say, and only kind of, is that that one has a higher probability of being wrong. Now, there are lots of edge case scenarios where this may not be the case, whereas the outlier could very well be a bike trainer and the two on bike ones use similar, let's say, accelerometer algorithms that are messed up because of something the trainer is doing or some vibrations or something like that. So in that case, you, you have to be very careful about the edge cases, but generally, for the most part, this works. Trying to move that example outdoors is kind of led me to accept what I call the transitive method. The big problem here is that normally to get three power meters on a bike, you are kind of limited to a crank or a crank arm. It's usually hard to get both of those and pedals. And the last one is a wheel. And the only one who has made wheels was PowerTap. And since their acquisition, supplies are dwindling. I don't know if they're out of production, but they're becoming less and less common. So now we need a method to deal with in the outside world. What if I can only get two power meters on a bike at a time? Imagine I have a power meter that I've done the odd man out testing and it is passed. Or alternatively, imagine I have a power meter that I have tested against another power meter and they matched. And then I test that same power meter against the third meter and they matched. So Basically, we are trying to build a pseudo reference. I'm not going to call it a reference because it really isn't. It's kind of a pseudo reference. So if we take that pseudo reference and we compare it to a new meter, well, if those two match by transitive property, we can say it's very likely that it's going to match two other meters. And you see how that works. So the first one, if you compare it to one, you don't get any validation. You have to compare it to two. So the one that you're comparing via the transitive property, well, it has to compare to basically three. Now, secondary validation would help bolster that. So if one of those two original ones that was tested against your one you're using now for testing your pseudo reference, well, if you took one of those two and compared it directly and those still matched, great. The problems occur in terms of claiming accuracy or error between meters when they don't match. So if you only compare your pseudo reference to the new meter and you don't go back and check those other two, you could be in a scenario where, frankly, you can't really make a claim that it's wrong. You'd have a stronger inclination that it is wrong, but not as strong as the odd man out, for instance. So it's a good method. Basically, it's getting your ducks in a row, making sure you have validated hardware that can keep self-validating on each other. But it, it really can't truly be related to making claims of how far off things are. So now that we have a methodologies, is there any other problems? Unfortunately, yes. Significant figures. So we've been fortunate to have fit files that helped unify data storage for sports technology, specifically running, somewhat swimming, biking. Unfortunately, power data is only captured as integers. That means our resolution is one watt. If we have a person riding two different power meters that match surprisingly closely, and we, we dig in and we follow the math through from the actual devices all the way back to storage, well, we're going to see a, a little bit of a problem here. So even when those meters are a very small percentage from each other, we see that they're in fact going to measure much greater due to the lack of significant figures. Now, because of this fixed accuracy, going to higher powers is the only way to get measurable accuracy. 
But because it's very hard to hold this at a constant pedal rate for long periods, that means that we have some limitations on how much accuracy we can really resolve. Most power meters do cycle strain gauges now. So say we sample at 64 Hertz so that we can get the power consumption down. At 60 RPM, that's 64 samples, but at 90 RPM, we have 48 samples. And at 128, we only have 32 samples. But we don't ride exactly at 100 RPM, but rather let's say we're riding at 121. In that case, we actually get 31.73 samples per second. And that's kind of a gotcha, depending on how it's handled internally. How the power meter interpolates 31.73 samples has an impact. If it just uses the measured samples and averages them out, we may lose a little bit. If it delays and uses 32 samples and averages those out, it can also cause skew. The most accurate being if it interpolates from 32 to the 31.73 and calculates from there, which would be the ideal. But that also leads to which interpolative method. While this averages out over a whole ride, when trying to do individual comparison on a second by second basis, it can have an impact and potentially look sort of like oscillation. So now we're being more strongly influenced by little things like internal data sampling rates. There is a whole other area on rotation detection that has just as many issues and problems. In conclusion, our current protocols and storage methods are really our first limiting factor on trying to test anything beyond that 1% error band. Now, in light of some of the reviews I've seen, that may be a moot point considering some brands can't actually meet their claimed accuracy. But if we were to start trying to push for greater accuracy power meters, we're going to need to look at upgrades to our protocols and data storage in order to achieve that. So thanks for sticking with me. It was probably a, a nerdier, a little bit more mathy, uh, and a little, uh, you know, kind of talky head. Um, there is a, only really a handful of reviewers who really do power meter stuff left. And uh, for Ray Maker and Shane Miller, um, they both use these methods as far as I've seen. And they both really stick to them. And I think that's why they're basically uh, the voice of the trusted power meter review. I've seen a lot of peer reviewed publications. I have a folder and then a few years ago I had recorded most of and tried to make a video out of um, almost shaming them because most of the things that I addressed in this video, they made those sins. And the biggest one was choosing a brand that they liked and saying that they were their reference and that they were right, even though their claimed error was just the same or greater than the other meters they were testing. And they never questioned it and the reviewers never questioned it and they are published to this day. Um, I think this video is a better method than what I had originally queued up, which was to almost call them out and shame them in a way, uh, but I don't think it really matters. Uh, we now have a handful of trusted reviewers in this industry and hopefully they, they don't uh, give up on it and holding companies accountable. Um, I, I really look forward and I, I trust these guys out there and they're doing a great job following these methods. One of the interesting things about those papers is surprisingly, uh, it's almost never engineering staff that write the accuracy papers related to load cells. I find that very curious, but it also probably is one of the reasons why these people are consistently getting wrong how to do error. So, Thanks for sticking with me and uh, looking forward to a few more videos in the future. So with that, thanks, goodbye.